respected principal scottish church college dr madhumanjuri mondal vice principal dr supratim das today's special guest dr konok saha my colleagues students teachers and other distinguished guests good evening everybody i welcome you all in the occasion of 17th jm das sharma lecture I, Pradipta Kumar Mandal, Secretary for Our Students Association, is your host today. I request participants, other than the speakers, please mute yourself. Today, our principal, Dr. Madhumanjuri Mandal, is suffering from throat infection. That's why she will not be able to deliver a complete inaugural address. I request her to address our audience with a single sentence. Thank you, Pradipto. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, madam. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Kanak Shah and distinguished guest, today terribly, um, my throat infection is giving me such a pain that I requested Pradipto that only I will say a few words, and uh, that is welcoming all of you to this uh, seminar. And especially, I thank uh, my. I convey my thanks to Kanok uh, for giving us time, and our for our students and faculty members and our alumni of uh, physics. And I am grateful to uh, our HOD, Joita, that uh, under her leadership. Uh, one after another, she is organizing many seminars, and which are of world standard, I should say. And so we are keeping all these in our YouTube channel, so that later on also we can listen to our speakers. And Scottish Church College, especially physics department. Uh, is overwhelmed by your presence, all distinguished alumni who are present today here. And I <clears throat> welcome all of you. I wish you all the best for this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. I request my colleague Susobon to take care of these, to, to take care that these recordings to be uploaded to our college channel. Next, I request Dr. Sudev Bhattacharj, President, Former Student Association, to say something about today's program. Sudevda, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you. Yes. I, I, I just uh, muted it because uh, 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 Professor Mondal was speaking. So I thought that I should <laughs> unmute at that time. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Respected okay. Professor Madhumanjari Mondal, Principal Scottish Church College, Professor Konok Shah, Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune, and today's speaker, Dr. Juita Choudhury, Head of the Department of Physics, Scottish Church College. Dr. Pradeep Tamandol, Secretary of Physics Alumni Association, and other participants of this virtual meeting. Good evening, everyone. As you are all aware, we are assembled here on the occasion of the 17th Jain Dashrama Memorial Lecture being organized by former Students Association of Physics of Scottish Church College in collaboration of the Department of Physics, Scottish Church College. On behalf of the association, I welcome you all. At at the same time, we would like to wish you all a very warm greeting. I like to take this opportunity to, make, to pay my deep respect and homage to Professor James Das Sharma, who was my teacher during my college days. I have no hesitation to state that when it comes to contribution of teaching of physics in the graduate level, teachers like Professor James Das Sharma, 
Professor Anil Chain, Professor Jyotirmay Chatterjee of this college stand taller than anyone by a wide margin. I feel privileged and proud to be one of the students of this iconic group of teachers in this prestigious college. Following the demise of Professor JMD, his admirers and students decided to start this memorial series in the physics department of this college under the guidance of former student association of physics. And this is the 17th lecture of the series. And we all feel very proud and happy that you have been able to continue this program very smoothly without a break and at the same time to keep this series so attractive. The credit also goes to the faculty members of the Department of Physics for their guidance and help in this respect. Today's speaker is Professor Konok Shah, Associate Professor, Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, Pune. He's a very distinguished alumni of this physics department of Scottish Church College. He has been honored with prestigious Santi Shrug Bhattanagar Award in science and technology for the year 2021 in the discipline of physical sciences. Professor Shah is an astrophysicist and his primary research activity is focused on how galaxies are formed in the early universe and how they evolve to present day worms. Today, he will be enlightening us on the topic of extreme UV photons from the AstroSat UV deep field. Incidentally, Professor Shah is the principal investigator of the AstroSat based AUDF project. All of us are waiting eagerly to hear from him, and I do not want to stay further into the time schedule and delay the process. We are thankful to Konok for giving us time for this lecture in spite of his very busy schedule. Let me end my thank, end my address with deep thanks to all concerned, the authorities of the college, head of the Department of Physics and department staff member, my fellow colleagues in the Physics Alumni Association for their guidance, support, and efforts to make this program a success for so many years. Thank you once more. Maybe I will hand over the mic to now to Pradeep. Yeah, thank you. Paul. Thank you, sir, for your overall introduction. Now, uh, let me invite Dr. Upendranath Gandhi to put forward a brief introduction to Professor Das Sharma and today, our today's speaker, Dr. Saha. Uh, thank you, Pradipto. Uh, respected Principal Ma'am, Dr. Madhumanjuri Mondal, Respected Vice Principal Sir, Dr. Supratim Das, Respected President, <coughs> Former Students Association of Physics, Scottish Church College, Professor Sudev Bhattacharjo, Our Head of the Department of Physics, Dr. Joita Choudhury, My dear colleagues, ex-students of the Department of Physics, and present students. Our president of former student association of physics has already told something about Professor Jain Dasvarma and about Dr. Konok Shaha, today's speaker. So my duty has been, I think 75% is already completed. Okay. Uh, as Sudeb, uh, Professor Vattacharya has said that Professor Dasvarma was a legendary teacher, very, very good teacher. Professor Das Sharma served the department from 1947 to 1981. It's a long period, long period. He was in the Department of Physics. Professor Das Sharma wrote several books like College Physics and some books on higher secondary physics. And he was a pleasant personality in the department so far as I, I have heard from our senior teachers like Chaurubda, Komalda, Kashida, Taposda, Somnadda. Actually, we are really uh, thankful to those senior teachers. Professor Susanto Shen, okay, who was very close to us in organizing this event. So you can see the number, number is 17. And so many great personalities, physicists has given this lecture. Today we'll be having our 
own own student ex student dr konok saha so we are proud we are proud we are proud of professor jain das sharma he was very famous not only to the students but also to his colleagues now to say some few words about today's speaker already professor sudeep bhattacharya has introduced the speaker dr saha is an ex student of the department of physics and you know all of us know that this year he has been awarded the shanti swarup bhatnagar award for his contribution to physical sciences he did his masters from banaras hindu university then he did his phd from indian institute of science bangalore during his work of the thesis he did some part at baltimore usa after completing his phd degree he did three post docs one at taiwan then german germany and then switzerland though he was at switzerland for a very small interval of time after that he had joined as a as iuka you know so we are eagerly waiting today for the lecture delivered by professor saha and the professor saha will be speaking on extreme uv photons from the astrosat uv deep field okay so i request professor saha to continue his presentation today see my screen am i audible yes yes and also screen is visible okay. this goes to full screen right? yes um first of all i like to uh, thank um, uh, the alumni association and scholarship college um for inviting me to this prestigious memorial here um I thank all my teachers. Um, it's been a, a great honor for me to be um, with you, and uh, thanks a lot for hosting me uh, today. Good evening. So today um, I'm going to um, uh, talk about extreme UV photons from astrosat UV deep field. Um, so. Um, I prepared this lecture, um, keeping in mind um, to our students. Um, so many of these, uh, the slides and the the top uh, um, stuff in that uh, would be uh, at a very uh, basic level. So apology to the all the seniors. So for if it sounds very trivial. And uh, I'll try to like give a very um, sort of spend a quite a bit of time on the introduction because this is astrophysics, and uh, this is not your typical laboratory experiments. So so there is a lot of things, you know, how what lots of questions comes to mind, and so so uh, with that I'm going to um, start. So first of all, um, the light from the stars right? when it comes to like uh, the light from the stars this is on the on it's my cars are visible hello uh, tell 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 Kono. i can't see anyone else can see the no, no, cars no, no, no. you just you just move the cursor Kono. Uh, i'm just moving the car <laughs> but i cannot see somehow it's very strange we are uh, it is not visible no it's not visible here no 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 yes yes now yes. it is visible now, now it is visible. Start the full screen so i'm so sorry about this i should have played with this before 
Okay, uh, no, don't worry. Like I, I, I'll just like you know, go ahead. See the on the on the left side, you see um, a, a, a plot which uh, which plots on the y-axis the intensity or the irradiance from sun, like the the, the only stars who with from uh, what I mean about whom I, we know a lot and also like no don't know a lot so so and on the x axis we have the wavelength and on 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 white color you see actually the the the, the spectrum of the sun okay. and uh, the yellow color is the uh, the line which is the black body uh, radi uh, radiation of the planet's law like you know fitted to this uh, uh, the solar spectrum the main idea is to um, show that the, the spectrum of the of, uh, uh, of sun, like from the stars, they follow like beautifully the black body curve. Okay, and uh, as you know, the black body curve is uh, very simple. Um, it's um, like a, like a one parameter, which is uh, temperature, and as the temperature decides the shape of the curve. Uh, as uh, the temperature increases, uh, the peak of the, the black body curve shifts towards the shorter wavelength side. And this is, you know, from your textbook, the wind's displacement law, the like lambda peak times temperature of the surface of the star uh, is basically a constant. So as T goes up, so hotter and hotter, the peak will shift towards the shorter wavelength and in terms like you know, UV. And imagine a star emitting this light and whose surface temperature is around 80,000 Kelvin, then the lambda peak would be something like around 362 angstrom. Okay, it's a very short wavelength and, and such short wavelength um, are basically called the extreme UV you know, light or extreme UV photons like you know, which carry this light. And in principle, like, any light whose wavelength is less than 912 angstrom. Uh, in other words, the energy is greater than 13.6 electron volts. is basically can be um, termed as extreme UV or uh, extreme UV light and extreme UV photons. So that's the, the that's the, the the very short introduction to the uh, the extreme UV photons. Now why? Now of course, like you can see. The in in uh, astrophysics uh, in in the sky there are lots of different type of stars, and on on the bottom you see uh, a real uh, spectra of a star uh, which is an A type star. So the stars have various different types, spectral type um, O, B, um, A, F, G. Like Sun is a G type star. And you can see like this A type star, the, the peak is not quite visible, but you can see that uh, it's, it's somewhere around 4,000 angstrom or so. And on the right side, on the, on, on, on the, on the top, uh, top right corner, you can see these are the model spectra, okay? Like we can generate uh, theoretical models of uh, the spectra of stars, of various stars. And you can see as you go from the, uh, M, G, A, B, O, the peak shifts, okay? Which means the, uh, the O-type stars are actually uh, emits um, uh, a lot of extra, uh, extreme UV photons and they are very, very hot, okay? Uh, 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 to give you a reference, the, the sun's surface temperature, as you know, around 5,500 Kelvin. And interesting part is that as you go from the A type stars to like go to B type stars, suddenly the, the spectra or the, the spectra drops suddenly. And it drops somewhere around the Lyman limit, which is around 912 angstrom. Okay, so then, uh, then uh, which I was talking about the O, B, F, G, M type stars. So uh, this is a very famous um, plot. And this is basically a cartoon here, uh, which is known by the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. 
which shows the luminosity measured in terms of a solar luminosity now on the y axis on the x axis of the temperature okay and you see this like solid line which is called the main sequence of the stars normally stars as they bow as they are born they they leave on the main sequence mm. um they leave on the main sequence and uh, they spend a quite a bit of time uh, on the main sequence depending on their mass so massive the more massive the stars you can see the main sequence lifetime is proportional to m to the power minus 2.5 okay so it's like so the more massive the stars shorter they live okay so that's the one point so which means that the more massive stars would leave shorter and they will go leave the main sequence and go vertically upward and spend the phase like in the giant phase the super giant phase and then go through the supernovae explosion and then finally the core like collapses and become a white dwarf or like you collapse a neutron star black holes so the key point to notice here is that the the o type stars on this plot o b type star they are very hot so hotter they are the brighter they are and shorter they live okay so that's about like you now very quickly i would say the um, okay now um, from beyond the milky way like our galaxy when you look if you if you are in a village you can see the very bright patch of stars like uh, uh vertically on the, on the on the sky depending on your location of course um they are basically milky ways are so we are basically at one age of the milky way and we are surrounded by the milky way like the stars very very blue okay now we don't receive like uh, the the starlight directly from a single star apart from the milky way so as we go as you look beyond the milky way the light actually coming from galaxies the galaxies are made up of billions of stars typically in a milky way like galaxy there would be about few times uh, 10 to the 10 stars okay all these stars are going on uh, in an orbit which do not collide each other like the gas particles like you know, because of the, their dissipative nature they would collide but the stars don't collide with each other it's not the not the normal case so the milky way uh, is a, is a, uh, is, a, is a, uh, from where we know a lot about the stars directly we can actually observe the stars and that's what we were, i was showing that the spectra of the stars like a type stars b type stars there are lots of like we 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 know how to measure them but beyond the milky way we only get the light from the galaxies okay this is a picture which is the cartoon uh, uh, is a like first map of the milky way it was produced by william herschel one of the famous astronomer 1785 with sun at the center of the galaxy and uh, that time it was thought in, in in that way and you can see these are all these dots are basically the location of the stars some kind of a shape like this and then this is the current picture of the milky way so it took almost like 200 years to go from the sun centric milky way to the milky way here and you can see that um, at the at the at the bottom of the you see somewhere there is a sun here at the bottom on this on this plot and this is of course not the actual observation of the milky way because we are inside the galaxy so this is a uh, bits and pieces of information uh, stuck together and produced it um uh, uh, uh in in a created a map it's a really artistic impression basically you could say right and the sun from the center there is some noise switch off the so sun uh, the is from the center of the milky way which is a very bright yellow looking elongated uh, object at the center which is called the bar of the milky way from the center is an 8.5 kiloparsec and i'm 
probably not going to explain about the kilo parsec because uh, parsec, one parsec is around three into 10 raised to the power 18 centimeter. Okay, kilo parsec means uh, thousand parsec. So, so, and the sun goes around the Milky Way with a 220 kilometer per second velocity. Okay, this is the picture of the Milky Way we have. So, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a like gigantic work from this 200 years of like a picture. And this is a very accurate picture. Now, as you can see, the, for astronomers like us, we have only light. Okay. Um, uh, that's the only thing that we can we can uh, seek from an uh, from a from an uh, extra galactic objects or even in the galaxy we do not have anything else and the light is of course the entire electromagnetic spectrum and different wavelength carries different physical information or the, the state of the galaxy right the light of the galaxy as i said is produced by all the stars okay now uh, you can see that uh, from the from earth from the ground basically we have a very small window called the visible window which is around 4000 angstrom to about 7000 angstrom and uh, that's the only part available and that's why lots of ground based telescope uh, are there if you want to look at into the like uh, uv ultraviolet x ray so you need to go above the atmosphere because for uv we need to, as I said, like you know, go to the space because UV light is absorbed by the upper atmosphere. Of course, there is if you go to the higher wavelength side, for example, like meter wavelength or centimeter, then we have the radio, uh, uh, which is which is open, transparent. Okay, and on the bottom here, you can see the picture of a galaxy at the center, and this galaxy has been imaged at different different wavelength, different band. Okay. On, 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 the, on the left corner, left side of this bottom plot, you have the, on the galaxy imaged in ultraviolet. And then you go to the optical, you go to the infrared, and you go to the radio, okay? It's, 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 it's like that. And you can see the appearance of the galaxy changes dramatically. Because as I said, the, the ultraviolet light, you, that's why I give you the introduction that like, it's emitted by very massive stars, right? And the massive stars are not common in the local universe, okay? Because the galaxies nowadays are not making a lot of stars. It's all done, okay? What we are seeing here, basically, uh, the galaxy already evolved over time. Now, now there is another way, like another the concept that we will come to is that looking back, astronomers always like you know, have information which we like look back because the the as the universe expands. The galaxies also like you now go away from each other, right? So, so the, the wavelength that will be emitted from the galaxy and what will be received by us, there will be difference. And this difference is related by the observed wavelength is one plus Z times the emitted wavelength, which is the uh, Z is the redshift. So higher the redshift, farther away the uh, source is. Okay, it's almost like a Doppler shifting. So the what we can do well, in, in, in astronomy that we look at certain uh, spectral line, for example, uh, the H alpha, like which is on the Balmer series line at 6563 angstrom, we can look at the line and uh, compare with the, the laboratory, um, the wavelength, which is the rest frame, which is 6563. And suppose there is line is shifted by certain uh, wavelength, let's say it appears at 7,000 angstrom. So by looking at the delta lambda, we can estimate how far the galaxy is and where from the light is coming from. So this is one way if we have the spectral line, but if we don't have the spectral line, then we can also observe galaxies in different filters, okay? Astronomers create like you know, many different filters spanning the entire electromagnetic range. And here I'm showing like one, like in blue, imagine this is in UV, then in the optical, then infrared, so various pass bands of the filters. So we can we can also look at that whether the same galaxy appears in all bands or UV there is nothing, and then suddenly optical there is nothing, and then it appears on the far infrared band which is in the red color. Then you can see that 
maybe this galaxy is like actually very far away because the wavelength will be shifted. Okay, so that's the way we, we look back. Okay, now here is a, at a glance, like you know, what are the current state of the galaxies from where we can, we can, we can, these are the like some of the, you know, the, the galaxies I arranged in terms of like how far we could look back. You can see that I place the Milky Way, which is at redshift zero, okay, which is now, and go to redshift higher, which is like being 0 0.5, 0 0.9, and then 1.6, 2.3, redshift seven, and then you have 10, and 11.5, 11.1 is the, one of the highest redshift, which means it's almost at the beginning of the universe. And this higher redshift, uh, galaxy, they are only observed in the infrared. They are not observed in the optical. So uh, that's what I try to explain. And you can see that as you go uh, from the from the local, like the Milky Way type galaxy, as you go higher and higher, you can see the galaxy shape is also like you know, changing, right? At least in the image, you could say. I mean, of course, this is is not the real picture. It is not the real picture in a sense because the real picture comes with the you know, convolved with the telescope function uh, goes through the telescope and then what we see so what is called the point spread function and and this is what we see and it depends on the resolution of the telescope and 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 so on and so forth uh, sensitivity so but what is clear is like you not know, the the pictures the images that you see at very higher redshift they are from the best telescope, which is the Hubble Space Telescope. And there you could see that they are basically like a pixelated as you go into higher red shape and or they are like a blobby, uh, things like that. So this is, uh, in, in other words, like since we are looking back at a different, uh, as the red shape goes higher, we are looking back. So which means that these are the young galaxies that we are seeing, okay? They are the young galaxies. So galaxies must evolve from this, young stage to now. Here is a cartoon I would say that you have a tadpole and you have a, a toad. And same thing I would say that there's a galaxy which is redshift zero, which is now. And with a redshift 10.7, which is like very at early universe, right? Now, if we did not know this life cycle of the tadpole, we wouldn't know that whether this tadpole will evolve to the toad. Okay, this is a this is a this this information that the life cycle information is complete to us. So we know which one is like you know, first and how it evolves, right? In case of a galaxy, this is unfortunately not possible. Okay, we do not know the full life cycle of a gal of any galaxy because we can only observe once and we do not see the time sequence of. That's a, that's a very, very challenging uh, problem in, in astrophysics in, in general, because this is, this is one, of the, one of the biggest challenges. So the question is, how do these galaxies at redshift 10.7 evolves to redshift zero now, which is they look like, because it must have been like you know, that way only. So this is the, this is the currently like you know, everywhere people would try to understand, astronomers would want to understand. And this is a, this is a, this has given rise to the building of the gigantic telescope. You might have heard about like you know, uh, the upcoming telescope, future telescopes, which are like 30 meter diameter, the big, big mirror, which is like a segmented mirror. Um, and then uh, the lots of space-based uh, 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 telescope after Hubble, we are uh, astronomers are sending uh, a JWST, James Webb Space Telescope, probably will be launched in 22nd of December. So uh, look for the news. And, and that telescope is diameter is 6.5 meter. Hubble had only 2.4 meter. You know, with Hubble we did, with, we, we almost like opened up the universe, like you know, the early universe. So when I gave it a tadpole, the, uh, the example, I just wanted to show that actually the high red chip galaxies, a lot of them look like tadpole. You can see the with a uh, bright head and with a like tadpolish um, um, uh, look actually. So 
so that's the that's the kind of um, the 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 introduction I I thought like you know, that would be required because as you move forward, now uh, we are going one step back and try to talk about uh, the what is important for our um, um, seminars today is that this is a universe at a glance like you know, this is the picture that you see this is also like in a, a, a cartoon um, the as you know like the universe probably have started with the big bang and then um, there was a very hot uh, big bang and uh, as it um, expanded it cooled down and uh, and at the, at the beginning there was only ions like already the like hot plasma so as the universe cools down expands and cools down there like the ions and electrons try to recombine and at around redshift of uh, 11 100 or 4,000 years old, when the universe is 4,000 years old, the recombination completed. So means the protons and electrons are combined, made atomic hydrogen. And there were, uh, after that, universe went through a dark age. There was nothing there, okay? And um, uh, over the time, so it, it, it's not a very long period in terms of an astronomy. Um, but but it went through a dark age when there was no stars, no galaxies. So suddenly, as like with the the instability and various physical processes starts uh, getting activated, the first stars formed, and when the first galaxies also formed. These first stars or galaxy made only from the hydrogen atom and a little bit of like helium and, and, and uh, heavy metal was anyway very low. Uh, in 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 heaven dense, so so this well, first stars because of made up from hydrogen they are very massive, as I told you the more massive the stars shorter it lived and it boom with supernova explosion and all the very highly energetic photons will come out, as the highly energetic photons come out they will try to ionize the hydrogen atom which is in the surrounding medium everywhere because a part of the you can imagine like at the at the end of the recombination we have a sea of hydrogen atoms right and these hydrogen atoms were probably um, uh, uh, started getting ionized because of the pockets various pockets the first stars and the galaxies started forming the photons from there started like reionizing and this process went on over a very longer period of time like close to a billion year in an astrophysical scale and uh, around redshift six, and when the universe was around one billion year old, the reionization of the universe completed. And we, at the present time, living in a state of reionized universe, which means that when you look from one galaxy to another, the matter between the galaxy are in a state of completely ionized, completely in a sense. Okay? So there is, of course, like, you no, know, there is a bit of a, it's not, never 100%, so, so, but it's mostly in an ionized phase, so fully ionized phase. The question is, like, what were the nature of this first galaxy, right? And how did these photons escape, right? All these lots of questions, like, you know, what kind of galaxies, what are the nature? We want to know all of this about them. And that's the kind of the subject of our talk today, discussion. Okay. Oops. Now, the, as I said, the, 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 it, is, it is easy to say that the, these photons probably escape, but, but we need the evidence, right? That's like what we did not see, right? At, at, at what happened in the, at the, the very first galaxies, nobody knows. We are all theoretical and, and some model. And the okay. So um, please mute yourself. Um, okay, all right. Uh, so um, now the we need evidence, right? That the photons actually escape. We actually like have captured those photons. That's what we need. But soon you will see that this is a one of the well, very very difficult task because. When the stars form, so in the first like in a cartoon picture, I show that there is a in a galaxy, let's say like you no, know, there are a lot of stars forming, right? 
these stars would form some will be like an you know, o type star some will be b type stars like you know, sort of like a spectrum of like you know, different masses of stars will form and as the stars form the the light from the like energetic photons from there will try to ionize the hydrogen gas because the stars are made from the hydrogen gas uh, or the hydrogen gas going to the molecular phase and then like you know, collapse further and forms it it's, it's a complex process the, even the even at present at the subatomic uh, the the you know, the phase uh, level the star formation is not very clearly understood but we 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 we, we live with that so so but main point is that that the stars form in a molecular cloud so and then there, there is a hydrogen gas around it and so as the stars form like you know lot of star was happening so there will be a, a sphere around it which is basically ionized hydrogen gas and then after that there will be a, a neutral hydrogen gas like a shell and there will be like you know higher heavy metals and stuff like that in astrophysics anything higher than helium and is called the metals so so now if we have a um, hydrogen atom so, so sorry if you have a energetic photons whose wavelength is less than 912 angstrom when in other words if it is like energy greater than 13.6 electron volt they will be used by the hydrogen atom which is surrounding this star star forming region right so then uh, these photons cannot escape okay uh, so so they will be absorbed so unless and until uh, there there can be like holes around this sphere where there is a channel of low density gas dust everything that that very low density stuff photons could escape from there and that's the that's the way like now one could there's another picture in which the star bus is so strong that it did not even allow to form the neutral hydrogen all ionized around so then the starlight and the, this this highly energetic photons or the extreme UV photons will 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 um, escape together. Which of the pictures is um, is actually um, uh, happening in the galaxy? We do not know. So that's the that's also like a very very unknown uh, the thing. So uh, so so the next step is basically I'm talking about the within the galaxy. So, which is called the basically you can think about the ism the interstellar medium of the galaxy right so as soon as the photons like you know come out of a star bus region there is a chance that it will get either scattered by the dust or uh, or or it will be absorbed by the hydrogen atom so very few photons manage to escape the interstellar medium of the galaxy and then if some photons manage to escape the interstellar medium of the galaxy, which means the galaxy as a whole, the galaxy also have surrounding, which is called the circumgalactic medium, which is also like you no know, kind of a hydrogen gas. So the photons could get absorbed there as well. Okay, so there will be further reduction. And then from that galaxy, wherever it is, how far it is, from there, there is a like there is a huge distance between this and us, right? And that's the intergalactic medium. And the photon has to travel through that intergalactic medium, the present state, and, and the photons could also get absorbed in, in, in this cloud, which is scattered around uh, randomly uh, in, the, in, the, in the path between, between us along the line of sight, okay, if we, if, we, if we look through the telescope. So only very few photons manage to escape the, the uh, galaxy and get detected at your uh, detector in the telescope. So it's a very challenging process, and 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 s s somehow like you no, know, I just thought I'll show this cartoon, which is la the labyrinth is like in, in this like bulbulia. So um, the the photons like you no know, are basically doing a random walk almost like you no, know, never gonna escape uh, easily the, the 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 galaxy. So it's a really amazing to uh, see when. The photons actually escape, and on the on the plot that is showing on the right side is called the transmission, which is the transmission probability uh, as a function of the wavelength and also function of the redshift, which also sh sh says that as you go to the very if you are coming from a very far away uh, galaxy, the light chances that they will be absorbed is very very highly um, likely. So so and and. Um, we, we measured this transmission probability uh, using the log of that 
and take you the minus, which is basically the opacity. Or in basically in terms of like basically you are saying that the photons are emitting from the galaxy and how much photons are basically are receiving uh, at your end and and you can basically explain by by the, the IGM opacity. So what is coming down to the the message is that the escape of such photons whose wavelength is um, uh, get a, uh, less than 912 angstrom is not an easy process, okay. and and this is the this is the, uh, the, the what we are uh, we we are trying to like you know, do with astrosat and so detecting the extreme EV photon on also this is called the Lyman continuum radiation and which as you know uh, uh, the the Lyman series Bamar series line and uh, and and uh, beyond the Lyman uh, limit there is hardly any so there is a sharp drop in the in the in the in the, in the radiation so now well, how do we detect these photons like you no know, so now imagine we have a filter uh, the the filter through which we will detect photons like you know, the broadband filter often characterized by a u shape like or you can say that like this kind of shape of the filter response which is a uh, lambda 1 on the lower side lambda 2 on the higher side and if the uh, uh, photons from that uh, object, whatever the light that you see, if it is like, so depending on the redshift, where they're coming from, and if it is below the line 912 angstrom, and if it is registered within this filter, then we say that we have detected um, Lyman continuum radiation, okay? Now, if you have a filter whose uh, wavelength is, let's say 1300 angstrom on the lower side, and 1800 on the higher side, then, then the Lyman limit for this would be one plus Z times the 912. And if Z is 1.4, this would be like 2,207 angstrom, which means that line with the, all the, the, the Lyman limit is below, the, the, the Lyman limit will be on the right side of the uh, lambda two, right? So in, we, we, we have, we have, using AstroSat, we have found that any source whose redshift is greater than 0.97, and if you put the 97 here, one plus Z, you will be able to see that, that, that all the Lyman limit will be within the lambda two. So, so, so the, which means it's a, it's a fully detection. So with this, I'll go through now very quickly what we did with AstroSat and how you achieve this. AstroSat, of course, like now for, is like already like more than five years now, and uh, in space, and this is the first Indian space observatory. So we are, we are. Uh, when I had the opportunity, I jumped into it, and I left uh, doing end body simulation and started looking at the the, the opportunity to observe because this is our uh, thing. So our first, uh, this is a made in India. So what we did is basically, uh, I took the astrosat and looked into a very blank space. Uh, part of the sky in the southern hemisphere for uh, some uh, which is marked by the blue uh, dash square and uh, this is where also the Hubble deep field lies or the Chandra deep fields are. Deep field this term comes in the in the in the my title deep field means typically a place in the sky in which which is um, devoid of any bright star because if there is a bright star it will it light gets like you no know, contaminated everything so you want a like a you know, dark patch to look through the like you know, deep into the sky why because the light from the uh, from the faint objects will get contaminated with the bright light right from the star so we don't want that contamination that's why the, we choose a very dark patch of the sky and when Hubble looked at this dark space of the sky, seemingly there is nothing, <coughs> no bright star. You see, like it opened up our universe to a very early age, and that's the Hubble deep field. <coughs> so we 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 did a planning of that, and we we observed, and uh, the uh, observed with a UV telescope. Okay, UV telescope, which is on board AstroSat. AstroSat has many other telescopes, the X-ray, UV, and all. These two UV, UV telescopes, one operates in the near ultraviolet and one operates in the far ultraviolet. They are simultaneously observe a patch of the sky. 
and it's a very small telescope, only 37.5 centimeter diameter. Okay, and this was built in collaboration with Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Bangalore, IUCA, uh, TIFR, Canadian Space Agency, and all under the umbrella of Indian Space Research Organization. And uh, these are the different filter response, which I showed like now cartoonish diagram. This is the actual filter response. So we use two different filters in, 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 in far ultraviolet and in near ultraviolet. And as I said, the far ultraviolet whose wavelength, you can see that mean wavelength is around 1541 angstrom. And uh, that such short wavelength are dominated by the O type, O or B type stars and which are basically very short-lived stars, which means if we observe the light from the, uh, using the far ultraviolet filter, we are basically probing very young stars. <clears throat> this is uh, very, um, very briefly how the astrosat observes in the VIT. So it takes like you no know, very short, uh, uh, look at the patch of the sky and take like you no, know, basically it's a camera, right? So, and between the two frames, there is a 33 milliseconds like a you know, gap between two frames in a normal settings. And as it goes in the orbit around the earth, uh, we can have around 1500 seconds of observation. So in 1500 seconds, we will get around 45,000 such frames. Some of these frames are sometimes showered by the cosmic rays, like what you show here, cosmic rays. So these frames are harmful, so we do not, um, in sense, it's not useful for us. So we remove them by we detect them in a in a in a soft using software that was written here, and 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 we we do not use them. And this is what in one patch of the sky looks like when you take an image. You can see like almost you see nothing, and this is one orbit image like uh, fifteen hundred seconds. It's just the pixels like in an far ultraviolet. And it is not very impressive. So what we do is like you know, we have around forty such observations done, okay, over like now about twenty-seven hours. And you can see I mark some of the dark spots in this field, full field of view, which is twenty-eight half minute diameter. And as you go from one orbit to another, the 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 the, the dark spots shifts. Like dark spots could be stars and galaxies, some some bright objects in this field. Okay, now we can have like forty such things, and then there is like ship. So we we take one of this image as a, a reference, and other we we uh, see the the shift like you know, between the blue, sorry, the green and the red. There is a shift delta um, x and delta y. So we use that shift and rotation and stack them together. So 40 orbit images are stacked together. And this is a very useful technique. And when you stack together, this is what you see. This is nothing like you know, impressive, but for us, it's like full of objects. You know, you can see now you can zoom in. I cannot zoom in right here, but you can zoom in and you can explore. When I made this, I used to explore this like you know, day and night almost, like you know, what is what is being done here. So you can see this like in a small square here. I'll show you what it looks like. This is what the square looks like in, in, in uh, 33 uh, kilosecond. And this is in one orbit, okay? And this is what it looks like um, zoomed in version, which is, uh, you, can, you can see that. And I can, I can zoom in more and you can see amazing like uh, objects, like so many faint objects you can see. Okay, and this is the Hubble, um, the extreme deep field image. Okay, so so this is like there's a lot to explore here, and this is what it looks like in a in a in a, in a, in a so impressive part of this image that I created is basically that not the bright objects but the fainter and fainter thing that you see, which is colored in blue because the blue is the ast astrosat part. Okay, red and green are coming from the HST. So we match the four filters, HST, optical, infrared, and uh, ultraviolet from AstroSat and match them together. And we seem to see even fainter objects than what HST Hubble Space Telescope could do within the same wavelength range. And that was the, the impressive part actually.
And this is what it looks. And I'm going to talk very quickly about these objects which I'm marking here. So before us to start, since we now talked about the Lyman continuum radiation, extreme EV photons, 2016 was the first detection of this. So you see in this plot, right? On the x-axis, you have the redshift, which is in the how far away from us. And on the y-axis is some ratio of the ionizing flux. What is ionizing flux? Ionizing flux is the, uh, the energy which is greater than 13.6 electron volt. And non-ionizing flux, flux, which is calculated at 1500 angstrom. So the ratio of this. So some way to like, so you can see that 2016 was the first few detection at low redshift 0.5 around, which is basically the starburst galaxies, which is the green piece and the, and the blueberry kind of galaxy, very young local starburst galaxy. And 2016, we already did the observations. And if we had everything ready, which I'm not telling the story, how much time it took for us to create that image, it took more than almost like two years to, to do everything correctly. Um, because it's because we are not ready, like you no, know, many people were skeptical whether we will see something with AstroSat uh, and, and all this skepticism did not let us develop things very quickly beforehand. And 2018, when I was writing the paper, there's also like you no know, detection at RHIP 3. This entire uh, gap between 0.5 to 2 remain like deserted. And this is called the Lyman continuum desert. Like you know, the, 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 this is before the astrocyte. After the astrocyte, we have the first detection in this, in this Lyman continuum desert at redshift 1.4. And this was published last year in Nature Astronomy. And these are the collaborators from Europe, US, and in Japan, and uh, some of my Indian and collaborator as well, who contributed in this entire work. And, and they are my collaborators. Even now. So how did you select this galaxy? Was it like a serendipitous, like a fluke discovery? It will never be discovered one more again. So is, if it is like that, whether it was like that. So to do that, what I show here is that we picked up around 1517 galaxies with spectroscopic redshift, okay? Where there is spectroscopy. Means that the spectral lines like hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, okay, uh, the oxygen three, which is the doubly INS oxygen, uh, all this line should be present in some of these galaxies. And then from there, we select a source. We said that like it is only possible between redshift 1.1 and 1.2. And then of that, like you know, further downsizing, we get only about 38 galaxies in the Hubble extreme diff field. And 38 galaxies were matched with astrosat image. Often we do not get a good signal to noise and within the, within the PSF of the, of the object, we have other objects there, so that's disqualified. So we have only two objects uh, cleaned and these two objects were selected for the study and one of them have very high equivalent width of hydrogen alpha and oxygen three line, which means this galaxy is a very actively forming stars at this range. And this is the part of the astrocyte image in far ultraviolet. And, and, and you can see if I don't tell you where this galaxy is, you would say that this is basically noise. And that is the main thing in, in, in when you look at a very high redshift path of the sky and when you make a diff field, we are basically dealing with noise, signal to noise at the end, which you learn in, in electronics and in other, other branches where how to deal with the, uh, the pick up the signal from the noise. That's the basic part. And this is where if I mark in the red and this is what the galaxy like zoom in version looks like. And this has a signal to noise around 3.2. And this was qualified, so, so barely, okay. And and uh, and that's the that's the galaxy we are talking about. But of course, uh, in in at the simultaneous at the same location in near ultraviolet filter, we have the detection which is at a signal to noise very high, which is ten. So this is a simultaneous detection at the same location in this patch of the sky. So it cannot be just a, a fluke uh, discovery. And you can see that we compare the HST. And with the, the astrocyte filter, you can see the HST is mostly noisy because 
the filter has a lot of dark current and other things, which is noise is, is basically noise dominated. And this is the entire like you know, wavelength from two or 2000 angstrom to all the way up to like you know, 4.5 micron, the galaxy is discovered in almost all the telescope. So in HST, this galaxy looks like this. So uh, within the red circle, that's the galaxy. And this galaxy has four clump like blobs, okay? We measured the mass of the clump, okay? Uh, uh, and also there was a question like, you know, are these clumps part of the galaxy or one clump is behind, one clump is like front? Or is this the same, is this a part of the galaxy? That was a question asked. And what we did is basically we, we looked at the, the spectra and we actually did uh, from every part of the galaxy, the uh, clumps, like the blobs, we determined, we estimated the spectra and we, 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 this is the H alpha line, which is coming at 1.6 micron. Uh, you can see on the first plot and then in the second C3, there is a peak here. And also in the C, which is the clump, uh, fourth clump. So they are all around the redshift of 1.4. So th this was a uh, confirmation that the, all the clumps are part of the galaxy and they belong to the galaxy. So the rest of the times are like you no know, very uh, detailed. And uh, we, we did a, um, the modeling of the galaxy with a various uh, interesting uh, model. And uh, the basic part of that, if you wanted to know that uh, this is the galaxies forming stars at a 55 solar mass per year. Milky Way forms at the star at one solar mass per year in our galaxy, okay? It's not really dead, but it's still forming stars Milky Way, which is like around one-ish solar mass per year. And, and this is a, this galaxy is forming at a very, very high rate. And it, its mass is not very massive galaxy. This is like a dwarf is galaxy. And it has also very low metallicity. And uh, the age is um, the stellar. Uh, the age is about the stellar population that contributes to this light, which is around 100 mega year. As you said, the, the the far ultraviolet band actually probes light, which is like a very short age. Now, this is galaxy is also very important discovery in a sense that uh, this galaxy falls at a redshift, which is between one and two. One and two where the universe had a peak of its cosmic star formation history also. So we expect many such discoveries to be like you know, coming up with, with, within this, this range. And this is the first time we show a galaxy which is have structures like clumps and everything in together. Okay, now there is, a, there is a, the question that we talked about, the escape of photons. So we try to estimate how much photons that escape the galaxy finally that we actually see, right? Now, uh, to, the, to, to know that, we need to know how much photons was produced first, right? Of, of, of this like energetic photons, the ionizing photons, right? So because not all the photons that is produced in a star forming region, they will escape. So only some certain fraction escape. So we first calculate what is the fraction of the non-ionizing photons, which is less than 912 angstrom we've done, which is could not escape, which means which got used in the recombination uh, process in the, the, within the region. So that we use a basically textbook uh, stuff uh, where we use the case B recombination uh, and uh, which can be expressed in terms of a hydrogen alpha line luminosity. And, and that's the typical atomic, uh, the case B recombination coefficients and stuff. So we, we know how many, how many photons could not, uh, were used within the galaxy. And since we detect those photons in the astrocyte filter, which means these are the photons which escape the galaxy. So we actually directly calculated the number of photons, which is around 0.5 into 10 to the 54 Lyman continuum photons, which means the ionizing photons less than 912 angstrom per second escape the galaxy. Then we basically, calculate the fraction of the photons, which means that the photons that's escaped, which we detect in the, our detector, and the, the below one, the, the, in the denominator, which is the total amount of photons, which means the photons that could not escape, plus the photon that escaped, that is the total produced. 
and we get a very clean number in this sense around 0.2. Okay, if we consider the photon, some photons will be absorbed by the intergalactic medium, then the fraction is around 0.25, okay, which is 25% or at least 20%. This can be done in other ways as well. So we calculate the distribution of the escape fraction. And you can see we, we peak around 0.2, okay. So we say that at least 20% of the photons, Lyman continuum photons, actually escape the galaxy. And this is a good news for the, uh, for the, for the even higher achieved, where we do not yet observe this kind of photons, but uh, that's a good uh, example of a galaxy that can solve that if, 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 if the first galaxies were of this kind, okay? Then it's, it's a good news. So 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 uh, that helps like an understanding. Okay. So after AstroSat, we have one data point in this, and we hope to populate this soon with the with data. Interesting part, another part here, which comes that this all these data points here you can see in the same plot are color coded. All are basically black, which means that the the wavelength of the photons are basically around 900 angstrom. Okay, ours is the shortest wavelength photon ever uh, detected. Okay, these are the rest frame 600 angstrom. Okay, it was unimaginable like now before because nobody could thought that we would observe such um, um, uh, extreme UV photons actually. Okay, and the just I'm um, very close to end now. So this is a this is a plot which is called the intrinsic stellar spectrum. You can see. The stellar perhaps uh, uh, sharply drops at 912 angstrom on left side and also on the on the on the right side on the left side. And after that, there is a uh, the spectrum like you now goes up, okay. And where it peaks around 228 angstrom, where the helium gets reionized, okay, and then drops again. So after that, we don't have the any more uh, of, of, of this extra, uh, the ionizing photons, but this goes into the X region. So now this curve that you see below 912 angstrom, they are model, like theoretical model, right, you know, from the massive galaxies and low very metal core, like, you know, like the first like uh, stars, it seems. There is no data point here. So ours can put one data point at 600 angstrom, on, on this and try to constrain what should be the ionizing spectrum at a shorter wavelength. So this is going to be a very interesting and hopefully, hopefully, like you now will be. Of course, like you know, there is a like there was quite a bit of news. I thought like trial show, but interesting one is you can see that one nature news at the end, which is the escaping photons finally arrested. So people were looking for. There was a lot of HST program that were you know, the Hubble Space Telescope program that were particularly dedicated for catching uh, Lyman continuum photons from this redshift range, but uh, somehow they missed it and, and we are, the, we are the, the, the first one in that. And in future, I'm basically um, now going even deeper and deeper image, try to see even fainter and fainter and farther away. So that's the aim. And um, with that, I'll... Um, our team is basically growing with a lot of other people from national, international, um, it's like uh, expanding. So um, with that, I, 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 I thank, um, I hope I finished on time. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir, for introducing such mm -hmm. interesting subject of formation of star galaxies, universe, universe to our audience. Mm -hmm. Though I am not expert of, the, of this subject, mm -hmm. still I enjoyed the lecture because your presentation with pictures and cartoons, I also mm -hmm. impressed to know your work with AstroSat. Now, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Bhattacharya, Bhattacharya to conduct the question and answer session. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, hello. 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 Ah, yes, sir, you are audible. Okay, okay. okay. Now, this is the question and answer session. Uh, naturally, as our expectation, we have received many queries from our audience. Uh, I have mentioned that 
we have received so many questions. I think uh, I am telling one by one. Uh, first of first thing, first question from uh, Show Modi on what criteria does those stars being classified as A, O, B, etc. Professor Shah. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the 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 stars like what we were classified is um, can you can you see the the slide here? Now yes. you can see that <laughs> yes, you can see that uh, we we cannot actually measure the temperature directly. So what do astronomers do? So what astronomers do is basically they, um, they image the star in one filter, let's say one UV filter, and they image the star in another optical filter, okay? These two filter uh, in observe, then we can actually calibrate and uh, take the ratio of these two flux. Okay, and these two ratio of the flux, in some sense, are you uh, or you can say that in astronomical terms, we can calculate from the flux. We can calculate the magnitude of the star. You probably have heard about that, and uh, and and we can calculate the like the magnitude of the stars in different different filters, and we can take the difference between the shorter wavelength filter to the higher wavelength filter and calculate what is called the color of the star, okay? So we can use the color to, uh, um, uh, to estimate the temperature. So there is a calibration being done from the, from the color to the, to the temperature. So, uh, and then that is the one way to like, you know, the put, um, uh, so if you know the, the, the color, so we know the temperature and if we the temperature, we have now the, uh, we need to know the luminosity. So the husband russell diagram is, is there, is a, there is a calibrated, this husband russell diagram based on known stars first, okay? So we know if we put a dot here, where the location is, we will know what the kind of star it is. But suppose you did not know, then you have the first timer. So you need to know the color of the star. And from the color, you can like get what is the temperature and you can get a sense of what could have been the, the, the spectral type of the star. And then there is also, because this is from the, the, the filter photometry, like when I collect the total light, you can also uh, get the spectra of the star, right? So depending on what are the kind of, like you know, the spectral lines are seen, uh, uh, this is the kind of spectra, right? So you can see the A type star, you can see there is a lot of absorption line, right? Absorption line, because how the absorption line occurs? Because the, uh, the high energy photons, when they go through the atmosphere of the stars, if there's a cooler, there will be, there will be like a lot of absorption lines. But uh, uh, so then we know that the, the uh, the stars are basically uh, A and other type where, where we can see a lot of absorption. Like this one way. From the very massive stars, often this like you know, so hot that there's a very few, the uh, absorption lines are not, not very, very strong. In fact, sometimes you may even see like an you know, emission. So, 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 uh, so, so using the, those spectral signatures, also one can classify the, the stars. Star. Another question regarding the classification of stars, uh, Devotri asks, it is, uh, it is the surface temperature of the stars that determines the O2M classification, O being the hottest. Is it clear? Indeed. Is it right? Indeed, yes. Indeed. That's the surface temperature. Yes. Because we it's never will temperature. know the, never will know the uh, temperature inside. As you know, yes. sun's temperature inside is 10 million Kelvin, mm. right? Yes. And the surface temperature is 5,000 Kelvin. The radiation, like which received by us, is from the surface of the sun. Another question: uh, uh, What is brown dwarf? Mm. Um, 
brown you dwarf this. are um, so so. <coughs> you, you can you can imagine like you no know, when when the, any star that forms, they form from a gas cloud. Gas cloud collapses, and and form molecular cloud. Molecular cloud collapses, and then um, collapses even further, depending. Um, you keep on collapsing at some point the density becomes temperature becomes so high that the uh, the, uh, the nuclear burning starts and it shines like a sort of which is known as star but brown dwarfs somehow miss that this is it's like the towards the end so it's like it's like not clear like you no know, the the um, new, new, new nuclear burning, but like we can observe somehow that is a, in the, using the infrared emission. So if, if you look at this from there towards the end, as the temperature goes down and down, so they are bound up one of the, the coolest object like in an in, in, in astrophysics. So they are, they are also can be classified something like a substellar object, like you can argue like, you could Jupiter become a star, right? Jupiter is a massive planet, right? So there is this intermediate between Jupiter-sized planet, giant planets, and the, the most dwarf star, <coughs> which is GKM, like you no, know, the even like no further like dwarf, so it's in between. So these are this those kind of objects. Okay. Another question is from Shomodi. Uh he asks that a different hypothesis are told. One of them is maybe the galaxies are revolving around something. What do you think on this, sir? Galaxies are evolving? Around something, something, something else. Then what do you think on this, sir? Okay. This is question to show. Okay. I mean, if I'm I'm not very clear what is the intention. Okay. Because they they depending on that, I would. Answer exactly. Uh, exactly. Question yes. is not clear. Can, can it be like you no know, bit more elaborate if it is possible? But uh, um, because galaxy okay. evolves, um, whether uh, do you want to know if it is depending on a certain physics that is follows laws of physics, or it is evolving somehow? Like you no, know, what is the so galaxy evolves definitely. There is no doubt about that. Now, question is there are many things like which I show here, like from year to year, okay, definitely evolves, but uh, it can evolve, for example, um, for example, one 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 thing that you would probably learn in DSC MSC physics is uh, maximizing the entropy. Okay? okay, so could it be that the maximizing the entropy principle is being followed while the galaxy is going from one phase to another to another, like, like that? Or is it something else? So okay. unless it is a bit specific, I would okay, okay. it will take me Another, to a very okay. uh, one question from Ovishek Paul. How was it estimated that the sun and earth were formed 4.5 to 5 billion years ago? Uh, I think these questions were probably more, <laughs> this is not, uh, okay. more for a geologist, I would say they will give you a much Good more answer. direct evidence than which I will tell you is in the sky and they you are on the earth. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so okay. I think I think they would be the much appropriate person. Okay, okay. To answer. Another question from Shobodi. Why does galaxies differ so much in size, safe, activity, and comparisons? Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, this is this is um, this is like actually, actually a very, very um, uh, the answer can be like very elaborate because entire <laughs> galactic astrophysics works on that. Now, um, it is it is it is in some sense that galaxies. First of all, I wanted to show this picture. Maybe can you see this? Um, can you see this um, slide? Hello. Hello. Yes, yes, we can see. Yes, sir. Okay, so this is the this is the, our neighborhood in some sense. This is our Milky Way galaxy, which is that this is actually the Milky Way galaxy look like in a Kobe uh, by the Kobe telescope 
uh, which is a space telescope in 1995. This is also um, uh, the infrared image. This is the Andromeda galaxy, which you can see by uh, naked eye, if you, if you try hard a bit, and go to the village side. And this is the Triangulum galaxy. These are three major, like you know, three galaxy in our neighborhood. Okay, Andromeda and Milky Way are going to uh, approaching each other. So they are going to collide over some time. Okay. So this is our very neighborhood. The distance between Andromeda and Milky Way is only 700 kilo parsec. If you look a bit beyond, this is the density field. This is, this is where the plus sign is where we are. And we are actually getting uh, pulled by the Vargo supercluster. And then Vargo supercluster is falling toward the great attractor it, because all gravitationally pulled, right? So everything is, you can see that this is the density field. So if you look around us, this is a complex picture of, of the galaxy density field. If you look a little bit far, which I, I think um, uh, I, that's, that's what I wanted to show. In this, is a bit far. This is a, each dot is a galaxy, okay? Now you can see that the galaxies are like very densely at some place and very sparse at some place. So the low density and high density. High density is a cluster of galaxies, like a lot of galaxies are together, like, you know, you could say like cities. And in the empty regions are like, like a village. You can see, think like that in, in, in the, if you like. Now in the dense region, the galaxies are not isolated. So they interact with each other. Some galaxies get like an absorb, like you no, know, the, the attract to each other, they march together and they change their shape. Okay. So many processes happens like in, 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 a, in a denser medium. Okay. So in a day, the, the, so the life of a galaxy from the very beginning to now goes through a, um, a process in which there is an internal physics that changes the, the appearance, not the appearance, but the internal dynamics or the, uh, the dynamics of the stars. And then suddenly something like the Mars, the satellite fell in, right? Or some other galaxy uh, joined Mars together that entirely change the shape of the galaxy, okay? For example, two spiral galaxies can march together form an elliptical galaxy, right? And that very likely to happen in a very dense environment. And so the life of a galaxy is actually um, 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 shaped by a part, the internal physics, like I said, like maybe a bit with the maximum entropy and things like other gas processes, or a bit on the on the on the on the environment which is shaping the like the galaxy. Internal side, there's a lots of things like um, as the grow galaxy grow um, uh, older, the stars go around you know begin with a circular orbit. The circular orbit gets elongated, and then when it elongated, it goes through at some point like you no know, chaotic orbit. There are like tons of like interesting thing that shapes the galaxy. So I don't think in one, I, I could like only give you a glimpse of like you know, why, how galaxies like you know, change, but uh, not possible in one question answer session. Right, sure. Uh, actually, we have many questions. Uh, yeah. A long list of questions, I think. Uh, just I am telling one by one. Uh, Another question from Devdatta De. Sir, what is mean by Lyman continuum photons? So Lyman continuum photons are the one uh, whose wavelength is less than 912 angstrom, which is basically the Lyman series. You have Lyman alpha, Lyman, Lyman beta, series. Lyman gamma. At the end, like no, you get to the continuum. It's a Lyman continuum. Another question from Ovishank Paul. What is the difference between deep field and void? Mm, very good what question. Deep, deep yeah. field and void. Yeah, very, 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 very good question. The void is supposed to be the low density region of the universe. Okay. And deep field is apparently the low density, but it's actually not. Okay. Now the question so, so void is actually when the galaxies form, you can see here. I can even point out to void, like you can see between this, this over density region, 
and this region there is a circular like you, know, you can you can mentally like you no know, make some space as a low density regions that's the void the, actually there is not much of a space, the galaxy there or and actually it's like object free almost deep field is apparently like you no know, look at a blank space but if you look deep there is lots of objects there which means like you no know, there are lots of faint which may be far away okay i hope i made this clear but that's the okay. that's the definition Yes, sir. Clear. Uh, another, another, another questions from Ovishank. Uh, in many popular science videos, they said that the number one by one thirty seven is responsible for fine tuning of the universe to support intelligent life. What is the significance of this number? Thirteen point seven. One by one thirty seven. One oh, by one thirty seven. It's a constant. I think yeah, the the fine. Actually, sir, I don't remember the number exactly. Yes, yes. I think this is something to do with the fine structure constant. Fine structure constant. Sorry, fine yes. structure constant. One by one thirty seven. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> I think this would. So the question is like, this fine structure constant is like actually coming from all the fundamental constants. The question is like, you no, know, as the universe evolves, with the fine structure constants change over time. So I think this is astronomers' interest. Which astronomers want to know if the fine structure constants are changing over time? Um, I think they try to probe various things, um, um, particularly the atomic transition lines that we see in in extreme environment in in galaxies, which are often do not see in lab, so we cannot probe that. Okay, so so I don't uh, I do not think apart from that at this context I would say much. On, on this. Uh, another question is from Onupam Shamonto. Uh, Onupam asks, uh, 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 why are all the planets around the, around the sun formed simultaneously or one after another? Yeah, Conclude so, so this, is, this is again a question <laughs> which is not from the, my talk. But, <laughs> But it's a, it's a, it's an outside. So we, this is basically asking a question: How did the solar system form? Uh, it is questions on solar system. Okay. Yes, and solar system form, as you know, like from the the gas cloud, which is which is long time ago, were there, and it fragments. That's the idea that we know that it it is fragmented, and when fragment happens, it's simultaneous, and each of these fragmented part like sort of grew bigger. But that's a very I don't think I am. We should give it. You should have another talk on the solar system. Uh, exactly. Okay. Uh, Dev Dutta, they asked another question. Is the staking done in order to achieve maximum precision in the image? Is what done? Sorry. Staking. Staking. Ah, the staking is. This is in the order to achieve maximum precision in the image. Indeed, indeed. Because uh, when one image, if I if I show you this, as you said, you can see that nothing much is seen. It's basically noisy. If you calculate the signal, and you calculate the noise there, so you don't see the the strong signal. So the stacking is often the the root or the the method. To enhance the signal, and same thing you can do even photography. By the way, you can take a lot of like you now very short timing shots, and combine by yourself. You can you can you can see like you know you can you can like enhance the signal to noise or, or of the image actually. Aditya uh, Aditya Ghosh asks one question. Uh, even having lesser aperture compared to Hubble, how did the AstroSat capture more than HST? Uh, I'm sorry, like, sir, um, can you repeat this? Uh, he, he, even having lesser aperture compared to Hubble, how did the AstroSat capture more than HST? Yes, I think I think that uh, <laughs> that was a one of the big hurdle that. Um, we have to pass through the when this paper have to go through. So, so the yes, to give you a very um, quick answer to that is that 
the the detector in the astrosat ultimately like you know, everything is like once the light comes um uh, it is the the electronics in 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 that so um hst detector is 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 something called the multi anode uh the uh, um what what is that so so the 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 important part that i say that when when you uh, yeah, the use the detector to like you know the 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 detect the photons it basically one photon hits the detector and and it generates like you know the electrons and the signal and that is what basically recorded in this process the the astro the hst detector had because of their like you no know, certain like you no know, the electronic characteristics they had a lot of internal dark current okay dark current is one when if you do not shine the your detector to some source and still there is a dark current and the dark current um, uh, grows over time like if you shine it more for a longer time it it because it's a temperature sensitive so uh, it 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 generates is basically the heating okay so that's the that's that adds a lot to the noise so if you think that the uh, oh if we had the hst detector pointing towards the object or the sky for a longer period of time then would we not achieve the the signal um which would be like you no know, detected but actually it's not because the, as the signal grows the noise also grows even more so signal is always buried under the noise and that is because of the characteristic of the detector that is one thing and compared to that astrosat had a the uv detector with a more simpler mechanism and uh, it's called a cmos detector and that uh, had this dark current like you know, the factor of 10 lower so that's what basically gave us the uh, as a, on a positive side uh, that's the another question is from monupom uh, again, it is, I think it is not related to the topic. Uh, he asks, just like in, a, in covalent compounds, an electron shares the, and the orbit, or orbital of two atoms. Similarly, can a planet revolve around two stars and be possible? What are the necessary conditions? Ah, okay. So, so um, of course, it's again like a bit different. <laughs> uh, but yes, so. Um, now the uh, yes it is it is possible and um, and now it is like you can see like you now this kind of pictures it is it is possible now uh, not possible it has been observed so i did, well, place to look for is um, kepler satellite okay the kepler satellite has revolutionized our understanding of the exoplanet and uh, so now we have example of uh, is this called the binary star binary star. okay binary star and the planet is moving away from the, the this thing it is also possible that the one uh, uh, planet like you know goes around this a lot of these configurations are not possible it's a very exciting uh, area which is which is like you know going on like you know very advancing very at a fast pace it is possible and there are examples of that i cannot give you the number but i should say that look at kepler space telescope um, uh, data type in the internet you will find many and so modik bag again starts said exploring is okay but said how can astronomers know things for certain certain since they only uh, they only look at space from one good vantage point Hello. Yes, but I, I, I think I think <laughs> that would. Uh, I mean, um, the space telescope is a like, good example for that. It goes around the Earth's orbit, right? Okay. So it observes from like you know, every like sort of. There is a there's not only one place where the object is visible. So you know, often, unless it goes behind the Earth. Otherwise, at least like you no, know, the good fraction of the orbit, 
which is at a 600 kilometer from the Earth's surface, the, the object is visible. Like, you know, it's not just one vantage point, I think. Isn't it? Uh, another question regarding exo exoplanet uh, from Ovisang. Uh, is there any probability of occurrence of ex exoplanets or stars in the intergalactic space? <clears throat> yeah, exoplanet, I do not know. Because uh, intergalactic space, you can think about, of course, it's like, what is intergalactic space? It's between Andromeda and Milky Way, right? So two galaxies, they're intergalactic space. It is possible uh, to have uh, stars in the intergalactic medium, especially let's say like no problem. Uh, sometimes it happens that there are lots of these hyper velocity stars, which moves at a velocity around 500 or 600 kilometer per second, okay? And that, is about to leave the galaxy, for example, our Milky Way. We know lots of hyper velocity stars now. So they are about to leave the, the this thing. And they will be found in the in the intergalactic medium, but I do not know whether they have planets around them. Uh, another question from Pritha. Uh, does gravitational lensing affect the observation of far UV radiation? Um, uh, I think the lensing would affect any kind of electromagnetic radiation right now. So yeah. UV will not be safe from there. It's basically light bending, right? Light bending. So it is nothing to do with the wavelength as per my understanding. Another question, last question. So what is hypernova? I don't think I know this. Is, <laughs> this is like I think you should you get a tons of like this thing from the from the internet. It's like some other space, like in supernovae. But I think I don't know about this. Uh, thank you very much, sir. No, so now, is this sir? Is May I have a very simple question? Okay, okay. Uh, Konok, I missed one or two slides at the yes. beginning. Uh, Z high means we are going towards our past. Past. Yes. So what is what is that parameter Z? Just simple. Z, Z is a red shift. Oh, red shift. Red shift. And if you, for, for example, uh, you can measure, let's say, uh, you can observe a spectral line, let's say Lyman alpha or hydrogen alpha or Lyman beta. And you see, uh, and I compare with the lab spectra and you see there is a shift. Okay, often these lines will be red shifted. Uh -huh. and... Agree, agree, agree. No problem. Yeah, I yeah, just correct. forgot that parameter. Yes, correct, correct. That is how the... I missed that. I missed. Yes. Thank you, Konok. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor Shah. Now over to Pradeep. Pradeep, please continue. Uh, thank you, sir, oh. for such enlightening <clears throat> for enlightening our audience with such rigorous question and answer session. I also thank my colleague, Dr. Hoppeche, to con for conducting such rigorous question and answer session. Now, <clears throat> I am going to end this session. Before that, I want to present my vote of thanks. I want to ex express my gratitude and thanks to my college authorities, my colleagues, my co-members of former students association, all our alumni, all the audience, and obviously today's mm -hmm. special guest, Dr. Saha. Without mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, and my special thanks to my colleague, Dr. Mm -hmm. Susobhan Pal, for his effort behind the scene to conduct all the online process. Mm -hmm. Without your cooperation, uh, this, uh, uh, this session may not be successful. Mm -hmm. So thank you all mm -hmm. again. We will meet again. If mm -hmm. anyone says something, you can continue. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I will end this session. Mm -hmm. Then, okay. thank you all. So, mm -hmm. Kono Kolkata, Amadere Khanna Asbe, Oshay, Oshay. Physics Department, 